Yeah. So good morning to all of you. Uh, we are here for the webinar on to survive and thrive under stress. Molecular lessons from cancer cells, organized by Dean Faculty of Science, Punjab University, Chandigarh, in collaboration with Department of Microbiology, Punjab University, and Association of Microbiologists of India, Chandigarh Unit. And we have with us Dr. Dipali Bandari, Associate Professor from Department of Biochemistry, College of Natural Sciences and Mathematics, California State University, Long Beach, USA, the speaker of our today's program. Dr. Prince Sharma, Dean Faculty of Science, Punjab University, and President of Chandigarh Unit of EMI. Dr. Kusam Arjai, Chairperson, Department of Microbiology, Punjab University. Dr. Vishnu Kralia from South Korea, and formerly from ICIB, New Delhi, as a special invitee. And he has been very impressed by our weekend lecture series and expressed a desire to join the lecture because of his interest in the topic of today's webinar. So we also have Dr. Deepak Kumar Rahi, Senior Faculty Member from Department of Microbiology, Punjab University, Chandigarh. Dr. Naveen Gupta, Senior Faculty from Department of Microbiology, Punjab University, and the General Secretary of Chandigarh Unit of EMI. Um, um, and other faculty members from the Department of Microbiology, Punjab University, the members of AMI, and other participants who have joined live on Facebook. I welcome all of you on behalf of the organizers. We also take this opportunity to share with the participants that Dr. Dipali has been the alumnus of Punjab University, or rather the Department of Microbiology, Punjab University, Chandigarh. She did her BSc and MSc from department and worked for her uh, MSc research with Professor Prince. She has been one of the bright and dedicated students of her batch with a lot of initiative and enthusiasm. She was a very sincere, hardworking, and a respectful student for all the teachers. And such students are very rare, which leave a mark on the teachers. And Pali was one of such students. So let's start today's proceedings with the welcome address by Dean Faculty of Science, Punjab University. So I thus invite Professor Prince Sharma to formally welcome the speakers and other participants on behalf of Dean Science Punjab University and President AMI, Chandigarh Unit. And I'll thank you. So share your thank memories you. with Dr. Dipali Pandari when she was your master teacher. And also comment upon the importance of teacher student relationship. So, Dr. Prince Sharma, please. Thank you, Dr. Soni. Uh, good morning to uh, all uh, who are present here, my colleagues and uh, my students who are uh, on the Facebook uh, and uh, all my colleagues from Punjab University and other places who are here to listen to Dr. Uh, Dipali here. And uh, I am uh, delighted and it's a great pleasure for me that uh, our alumnus and our student is here today and uh, we are so keen to hear to her. And not only that, we are so delighted that one of our students, among so many, he, uh, he has risen to such high, higher levels that now she is associate professor uh, in uh, USA and doing such good work that uh, she is publishing in papers like PNAS. And uh, it's a great uh, honor for us and great pleasure for me to have such students uh, with me uh, and with the department. And she has very kindly agreed uh, to uh, give a talk uh, on, uh, as the Dr. Soni said, on this topic, uh, to survive uh, and thrive under stress and molecular lessons from uh, uh, cancer cells. Association of Microbiologists of India is an organization which is uh, uh, doing, uh, in the last few years, we have been doing a lot for the promotion of microbiology and uh, allied uh, sciences not only microbiology, but biochemistry, biotechnology, and all that among our students for the promotion in society also. And um, one of the activities is there where we are organizing a Sunday lecture series. And this Sunday lecture series has uh, gone very popular among uh, the, uh, the society and among the people. And in this series, we call uh, eminent scientists, we call uh, uh, policymakers, economists, and so many other uh, uh, scientists to, to deliver uh, their talks for the benefit of our uh, undergraduate and graduate students and the young faculty. 
and uh, this uh, uh, as far as the student relation uh, teacher relationship is concerned i am uh, to share with you that uh, dipali has been uh, doing bsc she has done bsc in our department of microbiology and then she did masters with me and she is one of those bright students uh, whom i always remember and whose example i always give to my uh, students and uh, many of my just now i have another student uh, she's doing a phd in the usa just now i was talking to her before you start of lecture and i told her that uh, we have today a lecture you must attend dipali's lecture and she was also my student and uh, she was saying that sir mere ko bhi dipali jaisa banna <laughs> after phd <laughs> so uh, and the uh, people uh, uh, i it's it all of us teachers you don't know the pali that how uh, how much pleasure we gain and how much happy we are when students like you they come back and then they join and when we are proud to say to the uh, whole of the community that okay she is my student she is our alumnus and they are our people they have risen to these levels and now they are uh, far above they have reached far they have gone far ahead academically and every way from us also and all the teachers they feel very happy that when their students they uh, they gain um, greater heights even than their teachers actually and uh, i am so very much delighted and i am welcome uh, dipali again here and i have very very fond memories of you um when you were in the lab and uh, also you were like my family member you were uh, like <laughs> my daughter uh, here and you had uh, such a good friendship and relation with sahir my son also so uh, it's a great of all the fond those fond memories they are coming back here actually but still we have to go to the lectures here so again welcoming you back uh, dipali i am very much happy to welcome you and uh, I'm thankful to you that you have kindly consented to give you your talk here and um, uh, thanks a lot again dr soni please थैंक यू डॉक्टर प्रिंस शर्मा नाउ आई नो आई प्रोफेसर पुष्प मर्जाई चेयरपर्सन डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ माइक्रोबायोलॉजी टू फॉर्मली वेलकम द स्पीकर एंड द पार्टिसिपेंट ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ माइक्रोबायोलॉजी पंजाब यूनिवर्सिटी तो डॉक्टर पुष्प प्लीज थैंक यू डॉक्टर सोनी थैंक यू वेरी मच रिस्पेक्टेड डीन साइंस पंजाब यूनिवर्सिटी डियर डॉक्टर वीसी कालिया अ स्पेशल इनवाइटी हु हैज जॉइंड अस फ्रॉम साउथ कोरिया Uh, dear speaker dr dipali bhandari associate professor california state university all the faculty members of department of microbiology participants from all over my dear research scholars and my dear students with great pleasure i as a chairperson department of microbiology and on behalf of faculty of microbiology welcome you all for today's webinar on a very interesting topic to survive and thrive under stress molecular lessons from cancer cells and for its deliberations we have with us today dr dipali bhandari who is one of our own student from this department it's our really a proud privilege and we are so happy and it gives us so play so much pleasure to have you with us on this platform so i extend a very warm special welcome to dr dipali bhandari as we know that the whole world is passing through a very stressful and challenging time so while undergoing all this it becomes a prime duty of a premier educational institute like punjab university and department of microbiology to still keep up with the pace of attaining and disseminating knowledge amongst the stakeholders education is the most important attribute of mankind and because of this advancement of science and knowledge we are able to wade through this difficult time of covid pandemic the era of globalization it revolution and world wide web has come to our rescue and a blessing in this testing time so it has made it easy for the scientific fraternity to still come together and nurture their intellect and for this apt platforms are available for anything and everything quest for knowledge has not stopped and we are visualizing that life has not come to stand still for especially learners process of teaching and learning including research submissions examinations admissions etc they are all going on very fine very smoothly and all of us are getting i think adopted to the new situation arisen we as fraternity are playing a fundamental role 
and are acting as candle lighters in the current scenario so as to teach and encourage student community how to bypass the covid hardships the webinar is a this webinar is a reflection of the dedicated effort of department of microbiology towards this approach in this context and during this tough time department has been organizing various academic activities like webinars as dr prince told sunday lecture series and national web conference on various relevant themes and is trying its level best to keep the ball rolling the department has always upheld a vision to explore new vistas of science scientific approach and attitude where uh, it is evident from the research activities carried out by the department so it is specifically concerned with undertaking research of high caliber in basic and applied areas of microbiology aimed for the welfare of the society the department is known for imparting quality teaching and practical training with the aim to develop scientific temperament among students to make them competent in the fast evolving scientific inventions and developments across the globe and dr dipali bhandari is a live example today in front of us with this i once again welcome our young speaker i am sure she also must be feeling proud to come back to address to the audience of her parent department <laughs> right so i hope that these deliberations and healthy discussion of this webinar will help foster better understanding and insights and will also create a kind of synergy between teachers and taught which can actually do wonders for everyone so thank you all for becoming a part of today's seminar webinar and now i hand over the mic again screen to dr soni thank you dr soni dr soni thank you oh yeah. um, thank you madam uh, thank you for your comments i now invite that vc kalia to give his views and blessings on the weekend lecture series started by ami chandigarh unit and also on today's webinar webinar dr kalia please i think we should first listen to her and then we will comment <laughs> So I invite her to talk on a very good topic. I feel that will be the best thing to do. It's a very good initiative which people have been doing in the last few months, actually, very seriously. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are in fact, but I think today we will be relieved of it. We will learn the lesson. Please go ahead. So thank you, Dr. Kalia. Now it is time to introduce the speaker and and to invite her for the lecture. So before I invite Dr. Deepre Rahi to do the honors, let me highlight the significance of her lecture. A human body is composed of approximately 37.3 trillion trillion cells. Normal cells fail to resist the chronic biochemical stresses and thus die due to the same. But the cancer cells tend to live as they find ways to survive and thrive under stress. Their capability for survival and existence. Makes the cure for cancer difficult. One in five men and one in six women worldwide develop cancer during their lifetime, and one in eight men and one in eleven women die from the disease. The global cancer burden is estimated to be 18.1 million new cases in 2018. Cancer is the second leading cause of death globally after cardiovascular diseases. with an estimated 9.6 million cancer related deaths in 2018 that that dipali bandari try to find out how cancer cells cope with the stress and this work may ultimately contribute toward finding more effective treatments her research interest include studying the molecular mechanisms that help in deciding the fate of the cells experiencing stress with a focus on cancer cells and their ability to beat stress she will share she will share her experience 
with this research in today's lectures and i am sure that this will add to the knowledge of the participants so with these words i now invite dr deepak kumar rahi to introduce the speaker and invite her for the lecture so dr rahi please so i think uh, yes. dr soni yes yeah, yeah. hello thank you dr soni am i audible yes yeah, yeah, you are audible so please go ahead hello there is some network issue here hello am i yeah, audible yes yeah, yes yeah, yeah. okay okay a very good morning to all it's a matter of uh, great pleasure for me to introduce dr dipali bhandari who has been a student of our department during 1999 to 2002 dr dipali bhandari is an associate professor at the department of chemistry and biochemistry california state university long beach she did her msc and bsc honors from department of microbiology punjab university in the year 1999 and degree with distinction in molecular biology from loyola university chicago maywood in the year 2009 she has also worked as a post doctoral fellow in university of california ucsd la jolla ca dr dipali bandari has been awarded early tenure and promotion at college of natural sciences and mathematics that is cnsm california state university long beach in year 2019 she received the prestigious mayfield award for outstanding faculty member by california state university long beach in 2019 and was also honored with the most valuable professor award she received the certificate of recognition for educational opportunity program initiated by her at california state university long beach in year 2019 she is an active member of various international societies scientific societies including american society for cell biology american society for biochemistry and molecular biology and cell stress society international dr dipali bhandari is the review editor of frontiers in cellular and infection microbiology and ad hoc reviewer of a number of international journals including federation of american societies for experimental biology aging cell cycle molecular and cellular biochemistry and bio protocol there are a long list she has successfully completed four research projects funded by different funding agencies and one is under progress in her lab she has published 14 research papers in various national and international journals of repute dr bandari has also delivered various invited talks on cancer research and has presented her research at various national and international meetings besides she is the member of various committees pertaining to academic services including minorities affairs committee public policy committee member research project review panel she is also heading various committees at uh, university level she is doing a wonderful job at a place so friends dr dipali in short period of her career has touched various new horizons in the field of her research she is doing a wonderful job at a university and has also made we people proud being our student i myself and behalf of all my colleagues congratulate you for your achievements and wish you all the success in your future endeavor now i invite dr dipali bhandari for the talk she will be talking on the topic uh, to survive and thrive under stress molecular lessons from cancer cells dr dipali please okay. thank you so much dr rahi uh, dr soni dr herjai and prinsar i just don't have words to say uh, thank you for such an elaborate introduction and um such good things said about me i am not sure i deserve all of them 
In fact, I would like to share with the undergrads in the audience that my first year, you know, the transition from high school to undergrad, I think I almost failed math. Um, I barely passed, but you know, that was the first year and I kind of got my um, things going and I knew that you have to study and it's college, it's different, it's honor school and the professors are really in it for you. If you give it your best, they will root for you, they will work with you. And I haven't looked back since then. So that was the first year hurdle and I haven't looked back since then, but I had a lot of support. And I'll show you some uh, old pictures uh, from when I was in the department and that's almost 25 years ago now. Gosh, and um, I think um, Dr. Herjai said, um, a young, uh, scientists, I'm not so young anymore, <laughs> unfortunately, but um, let me start sharing my screen. And it's it's a real pleasure to be back here. This is home for me. This is homecoming. And I will never say no to uh, an invitation coming from um, Department of Microbiology, Punjab University. You've given me so much and it's, it's a very little gesture that I could make to accept uh, this invitation. So thank you so much for having me here. Um, and I'll share my screen with you now so we can get started on um, the work that I have been doing in the last um, six years or so since having my independent lab at Cal State Long Beach. Um, let me just get my laser pointer. Okay. Um, so as um, you were already told, the title of my talk today is to survive today is to survive thrive under stress, thrive and under the molecular lessons uh, learned from cancer cells. Um, I am an associate professor of biochemistry at CSU Long Beach, uh, California, as you just heard. Um, so this is the beautiful city of Long Beach. This is the uh, marina. Uh, I don't go out there much because I don't have much time to enjoy it, but it is a beach city and it's beautiful. So there's a lot to do uh, if you have uh, some free time. Uh, but this is where I spend most of my time. So that's Cal State um, Long Beach uh, or LB. That's our logo right here. Um, it's a very big and beautiful campus. Uh, and this is one of the 23 campuses of the California State University system. And we are situated in the city uh, of Long Beach. Um, we have uh, close to 40,000 students total enrolled in the university in all the different uh, colleges. But my college is the College of Natural Sciences and Mathematics, and I am uh, a faculty member in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry there. But let's start from the beginning. Um, so this is where uh, my scientific journey began. This, uh, the few pictures here on the left and the top one on the right, this was taken in uh, Prinzer's lab uh, where I spent about two, two and a half years getting my master's degree. One of the best time of my life and what I wouldn't give to go back to this time. Um, this is when, um, these were the formative years of my life. This is where I learned um, so much that it gave me a foundation uh, solid foundation, academic foundation that I have built on ever since. And uh, it was not just all uh, work and no play. As you can see, most of these pictures are you know, having fun in the lab uh, with my other uh, classmates and seniors. And what I miss the most is the cultural events, um, you know, the Diwali parties, the um, inaugural function and the uh, annual function. So I used to be there in all of them um, and I really had a great time. But this is where, as I said, the foundation was built and a very solid one at that. Um, and wherever I went uh, after uh, this, I had a relatively easier time than many of my peers or colleagues because I was so well prepared. So thank you uh, to all the faculty members who taught me. Um, Let's go a little bit further back. So I grew up in a town uh, near Ludhiana. Uh, it's Jagrao right here. And I did my um, elementary school and middle school in Jagrao before moving on to um, Chandigarh for my high school. And um, soon after that, I was um, I joined 
the BSc Microbiology Honors Program uh, at Punjab University, Chandigarh. Uh, that was 1996 to 1999, a long time ago. Um, and then I stayed uh, in the department and got my master's degree. Um, and I did my master's under uh, Dr. Prince Sharma. In 2002, when I graduated, early 2002, was January, I think, um, I wasn't sure uh, what I wanted to do next. I wasn't sure if I wanted to get my PhD at that time. Uh, so I took a little time off um, and got a job um, in R&D biotechnology. It was a newly built department in the company, uh, Advanced Micro Devices Private Limited, and it was in Ambala. So I spent about two years there, and they had um, started an engineering college with a biotechnology degree in it. Um, and they got me involved with the college as well. And that's where within a year of being in the company, I realized that my heart really uh, was in academia and that I needed to learn more. And that's when I uh, decided to apply for PhD programs in the US. And I got admission uh, in Loyola University, Chicago. So I know here the plane is kind of flying the, in the wrong direction, but my flight was from New Delhi to Chicago because I was going to get, uh, I was going to join the molecular biology graduate school program at Loyola University in Chicago. Uh, just a little fun fact, this was my first ever flight. I had never flown before, no domestic flights. Uh, so my first ever flight ended up being um, the longest also. So it took me about 24 hours with about um, 20 hours of flying and then the layover. But it was a good and big adventure and I enjoyed uh, Doing my PhD, I learned a lot there, uh, and I graduated with uh, distinction in 2009, which is when I started doing my postdoctoral fellowship at uh, UC San Diego. Uh, I spent about five years here um, before getting my own independent position as an assistant professor at that time in, in 2014 at CSU Long Beach, and I was recently promoted to uh, associate professor. Um, so I've spent about six years uh, in the department. So this is what I study in my lab. Um, after I finished my postdoctoral training, I wanted something of my own, something that I could build up on my previous training, but also something that was different from uh, what I'd done in my PhD, what I'd done in my postdoctoral training. So I study stress, but not... Um, the kind of stress you would think. Uh, this is, I study stress at a cellular level. I, I like to study things at a molecular level. So I study how cells get stressed and how do they deal with it, um, essentially. So how would you define uh, stress or a cellular stress is any perturbation in the homeostasis. So anything that takes your cells away from homeostatic balance, uh, that creates stressful conditions. And when that happens, depending on the time, um, that is the duration or severity of the stress, uh, you have the uh, potential of getting macromolecular damage, which is your proteins, your lipids, uh, the cell membranes can get affected. Um, so cell stress comes in many different flavors. The one I particularly focus on is called the endoplasmic reticulum stress. So if you've had uh, intro level cell biology, uh, you would know that um, eukaryotic cells have uh, compartmentalization within the cell and they have different organelles and one of the largest organelles within a eukaryotic cell is the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, this uh, membrane bound organelle is especially enriched in secretory cells. Uh, for example, your pancreatic beta cells that secrete insulin anytime you eat, anytime the blood glucose levels go above um, the homeostatic levels. So all these tubular shaped uh, structures that you are seeing in this uh, transmission electron micrograph of a pancreatic exocrine cell, uh, all of this is the ER. Um, so from now on, I will be calling the endoplasmic reticulum uh, ER for short. So you can see there's a lot of ER in this cell. You can see some mitochondria on the side and you can see the nuclear um, membrane right here. And that's a nucleus, but this cell is uh, really filled with uh, the ER. It's a very important organelle. It's a major site for um, protein synthesis. Almost one third of the proteins in our cells are uh, being processed and folded in the ER. 
before being sent to their respective locations. Uh, and um, it's, as I said, uh, the protein transport or sending proteins to where they need to be within the cell. A lot of it goes through the ER. It's also a um, storage site for um, calcium and as well as synthesis site for lipid and steroids. So a very important organelle does a, a bunch of important functions for the well-being of the cell. So how does ER get stressed? You know, if it's like uh, us, how do we get stressed? If I'm overworked, if I have uh, too much work to handle in a little amount of time, I'll get stressed. And the same uh, fundamental principle allow, um, applies to the cells and the ER being stressed. So anytime you are asking the ER of a cell to go in overdrive and overwork, this uh, the ER will start ex start experiencing stress. And that happens in our normal physiology. Anytime you eat, you know, three meals a day, four meals a day, um, anytime you eat and your blood glucose level goes above 4.5 millimolar, um, at that time, your beta cells in the pancreas are going to uh, spit out insulin. So what you see here is the electron micrograph. Uh, and the, this big black ball is actually insulin, yeah, all ready to go. And this membrane has already uh, fused, and the insulin is right, uh, ready uh, to be released. Uh, so that's the job of your um, beta cells. But every time you eat, now they're working a little more than they were when you hadn't eaten. So that's part of our normal physiology and our cells are quite equipped to deal with uh, this kind of stress. The problem comes when uh, the level of ER stress uh, goes beyond what the cell can control and bring back the homeostasis. That's when uh, disease states can occur, for example, type two diabetes. If a person is pre-diabetic uh, or type two diabetic at that time, the amount of insulin your beta cells are spitting out into the bloodstream is just not enough. And to compensate for that, um, your beta cells are gonna make more and more insulin. And all of this, remember, the insulin gets packaged, folded and packaged, it all begins in the ER. So the ER is stressed at that time. And um, when a person becomes type two diabetic or is diagnosed um, as type two diabetic, at that time, uh, the beta cells have actually died. A lot of them have died because they just could not deal with that amount of stress. They tried their best, but uh, there comes a point when the cells decide that this is too much, I cannot recover from this amount of stress. So they, they end up killing themselves. Uh, same thing, neurodegenerative diseases. So it's a cause or effect type of a relationship. Uh, but what we focus on is cancer. So that's the main focus of my lab so far slowly we are moving into type 2 diabetes as well. But today what I'm going to share with you is the story on how cancer cells beat stress and use it to their advantage even. So let's talk about how do cancer cells get stressed? You know, why do they even get stressed in the first place? Um, so it may sound counterintuitive, but tumors do grow in a very stressful environment. Uh, when an extra mass of cells uh, begins uh, begins uh, proliferating within your body, uh, remember they are growing at a very high speed and they're also dividing uh, quite fast, faster than the other normal cells. And first of all, they weren't even supposed to be uh, growing there. They are also competing for space. There's not that much space to, to grow. They're also facing limited nutrients because uh, at least early on, the tumor um, does not have any blood vessels to supply it with uh, plenty of nutrients, food, or even uh, oxygen. So all of this together, the limitation of glucose, and glucose is used to um, attach an important modification on the proteins that are folded in the ER. So if you are limited in glucose, that can constitute um, a type of ER stress because your proteins will not fold properly and they will start um, misfolding or unfolding, and that can trigger ER stress. So once a cell uh, is faced with ER stress, what, what, what does a cell do? A cancer cell or a normal cell? Uh, so this ER stress, as soon as the ER senses it, uh, a signal transduction program, an evolutionarily conserved uh, signaling program kicks in, and it's called the unfolded protein response, or UPR for short. 
the main goal of UPR is to reestablish homeostasis uh, by doing a few things. And these are uh, reduce protein translation. If we are having a big load of protein to be made and to be folded in the ER, and that's causing the stress, why make more protein? Let's stop general protein translation. Let's figure out how to deal with what we have right now. And with that, the cell also increases the folding capacity of the ER. And here are special proteins whose job is to help other proteins fold into their functional state. And those are called chaperones. So reduced um, general protein translation and increased folding capacity of the ER. And the third thing that this program will do is increase degradation of misfolded proteins. So if a protein, you've tried to fold it a few times, but it's futile, the cell will rather get rid of it. So they start degrading uh, some terminally misfolded proteins to decrease the load on the ER. And remember, the main goal is to go back to homeostasis. But under certain conditions, uh, if the ER is not tackled within a reasonable amount of time and the stress becomes chronic and not alleviated in a timely manner, and you can actually relate this to a clinically depressed person, uh, things have gone out of hand. And at that point, the cells, uh, in the interest of greater good, they will choose um, cell death uh, or apoptosis. So as I told you, cells have to make a life or death decision depending on the severity or duration of the ER stress. But in case of cancer cells, uh, as the uh, German philosopher Nietzsche said, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Uh, that is quite applicable to cancer cells. Uh, so what they do is they somehow uh, figure out a way to keep surviving uh, during the stress. And a lot of literature now suggests that their ability, they, the cells having faced this ER stress early on in their lifetime and upregulating the um, cell survival pathways or signaling, they also tend to become more chemo resistant later on in their lifetime. So what I am trying to understand in my lab is what makes a cancer cells survive through this ER stress. So I'm gonna introduce this protein that's going to be the focus of the, um, <coughs> the research work that I'm gonna show you. Um, it's a big name, uh, so we'll just go with the acronym, G-alpha interacting vesicle associated protein. We'll call it GIV for short. It's also uh, known as GERDEN. So some research groups uh, call it GERDEN. Uh, we choose to call it GIV. So let's stick with GIV. GIV is a big protein. It's about 1,870 amino acids long. Uh, its molecular weight is 220 kilodaltons or so. Uh, it first evolved in its um, current form in birds, and it has been kept quite conserved uh, very well um, to the higher mammals, which is us. So what does GIV do? It was the function of this protein. So GIV was discovered in 2005 by four labs throughout the world independently. Um, it, my postdoctoral lab uh, was one of the labs that discovered GIV in that same year. And so I'm going to summarize about 15 years worth of work uh, done on GIV. <coughs> Excuse me. In a very simplified manner, there is a lot more to give, but just for the purposes of this talk, and I know there are a lot of undergrad students in the audience. Let's just uh, keep it very simple. And what this is supposed to be is a cell cut in half. So you're looking inside the cell. And um, please remember that a cell is a very complex place. It's very crowded. <laughs> Kept it very uh, clean for you. Hello. Only showing things that matter uh, for this Hello. animation. So cells Hello. Have to respond to uh, any signals. So we have receptors. Uh, these are protein receptors at the cell surface. Once the cell receives a signal, in this case, it's epidermal growth factor receptor, and its uh, signal is epidermal growth factor. It's a growth factor. So when EGF comes and binds to the to one monomer of uh, the receptor, it leads to oligomerization uh, of two different copies of that uh, receptor. Once that happens, that triggers a conformational change which allows the this um, 
receptor to autophosphorylate uh, itself. Now, phosphorylation is a key modification that is very important in signal transduction. Uh, it's just a post-translationally uh, modified protein. Uh, you just add a phosphate on either a serine, a threonine, or a tyrosine in this case for EGFR. And that phosphorylated tyrosine actually serves as the binding site for many other proteins that are inside the cell. Example, in this case, when that gets phosphorylated, it becomes a binding site for GIV. Once GIV binds there, the receptor phosphorylates GIV as well. The P's here uh, represent phosphorylation. Once GIV gets phosphorylated, it makes a binding site for another protein called PI3K. So let's just um, go with the acronyms. Uh, I apologize, you know, uh, the cell biology or biology in general is filled with uh, acronyms. So just to keep things simple, and uh, just so you have an overall idea. So PI3K gets recruited, PI3K phosphorylates, it's a lipid kinase. So what you're seeing here is on the cell surface, the membrane lipid phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate. PI3K is going to add another phosphate, making it PIP3. PIP3 is a binding site for two other proteins called PDK1 and AKT. Just remember AKT, that's the main protein we'll come back to. PDK1 is a kinase, it phosphorylates AKT. Another kinase comes and phosphorylates AKT on another site. This doubly phosphorylated AKT is now fully active. And this is the hub of many, many different signal transduction pathways originating downstream of many different receptors and one of the key pathways mutated or overactivated in cancer cells. Why? Because it's multiple downstream targets, they have uh, main goals of increasing cell survival, growth, proliferation, and keeping cell death at, under check at bay. So you can imagine why uh, AKT mutating into a hyperactive form will um, or can lead to a cell becoming cancerous. So let's just, all I want you to remember from this slide is uh, give and AKT, okay? So the question, when I first started my lab, in my very first year, we, we asked, does AKT get activated during ER stress in cancer cells? Is that how they survive? Uh, and if so, does GIVE have anything to do with this pathway? AKT can get activated uh, via other pathways as well, but we wanted to see if GIVE plays a role in um, AKT activation during ER stress. We chose a very simple model system, HeLa cells. Um, you may have heard of these cells. This is the first uh, ever cell line to be maintained uh, in a laboratory environment. Uh, it's named after the woman uh, who it was isolated from, Henrietta Lacks. Right here, um, there's a book written on <coughs> Henrietta. Unfortunately, she died at a very young age because of the cancer, because it was a very aggressive form of cervical cancer. And these cells were isolated from Henrietta before she died. Uh, but this book is about the ethical um, implications because uh, Henrietta was never informed and there was no consent taken. And they've also, if you like to read books, it's a very good read. I highly recommend it. If you are someone who would rather watch a movie and enjoys movies more, they also made a movie on it. And Oprah Winfrey starred in this movie. Uh, she played the daughter of Henrietta Lacks. So let's go back to the science part. So I use HeLa cells um, uh, in my cell quite a bit. This is what they look like under um, a regular microscope. And this is a very pretty picture of um, HeLa cells stained for different cytoskeletal markers and nuclei. This is not my own um, data. This was taken uh, from another scientist. Um, so how do we detect if AKT gets activated during ER stress or not? So as I said, we grow these cells in a Petri dish. Um, I have to ER stress them somehow. I use a chemical ER stressor, tunicamycin. So it also messes up another post-translational modification that is key for proteins to fold properly in their functional state in the ER. So if you treat the cells with tunicamycin, they will start experiencing ER stress within minutes. And I can choose my time of stress. And after that, I just break open the cells, lyse them, and I analyze for AKT activation by Western blotting. And 
what do I blot for? Remember I told you once phosphorylated <laughs> AKT is fully active. So I will be blotting for the phosphorylated form of AKT and that becomes my readout. This is what a Western blot looks like if you've never seen one. Um, so basically you're, you are trying to detect a very specific protein out of the thousands, tens of thousands of proteins that your cell is going to have at any given time. You break it open, you load it on a gel, and then you come in with an antibody to the protein that you're interested in. And in this case, I'm interested in phosphorylated AKT, PAKT. And I also load for, um, or also blot for a loading control that I loaded um, roughly the same amount of sample in each lane. And that's glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. That's a um, glyco glycolytic enzyme. Um, so what I did was I treated my cells for, with no uh, tunica mycin or tunica mycin for 30 minutes, one hour, and three hours. And after that, I lysed the cells and blot for phosphate uh, Think uh, And if you see the thickness of the band increasing, that means you have more of that protein uh, in there at that time. So we tried this with tunica mycin, we tried it with other ER stressors, we've tried it with different cell lines, and all of them do activate AKT after you hit the cells with ER stress. So that confirmed that AKT was being activated. But my next question was, is GIVE important for this AKT activation? So how do we do that? So we made cell lines uh, where this is a control cell line, which has its um, genomic DNA that will get transcribed and the give gene will give you the give protein. Then my genetically engineered give depleted cell line, what I do is I treat it with a small hairpin RNA and that attacks specifically just the give mRNA. So it's gonna chop up the give mRNA, no mRNA, no protein. So these cells will, we'll call them give depleted because they won't have much give. So shRNA doesn't completely wipe out the uh, protein because you no, know, there may be some mRNA left and some you'll see some residual translation. But for the most part, as you can see here, it's a Western blot. So here I'm looking at the give protein now. The control cells make a um, good amount of it, whereas give depleted cells um, have drastically reduced the expression. And with this, when I did the same experiment, I ran a blot and I saw phosphate KT levels. You can see at three hours in my give depleted cells, this is quantified data from uh, N of three or four uh, and statistically analyzed. So if you look at control cells, black bar is DMSO or vehicle control. So no uh, ER stress here. That's the basal level of phosphate KT in the cell. Within three hours, it significantly increases Whereas in give depleted cells, you don't see that significant increase, which told us that give does play a role in AKT activation during ER stress. Um, we did uh, a bunch of other experiments in between. I'm not gonna show them uh, for time's sake, but um, I will uh, show you the paper where it's published. Uh, if you are interested, please uh, do give it a read and let me know if you have any questions. But I'll cut to the uh, crux of the paper here. So then we wanted to see, okay, let's, um, if GIVE is leading to AKT activation in HeLa cells during ER stress, will they not survive as much if I take GIVE away, take GIVE out uh, of these cells? So to test this, we do an assay uh, called the MTT assay. And MTT stands for this long name. You can read it, but we'll just call it MTT. So MTT is yellow in color. Um, and when you um, put it on a, a cell suspension or cells in this um, plated in this plate over here, um, if it's a viable cell, if it is uh, an alive cell, metabolically active cell, it will have the enzymes dehydrogenases, um, which will uh, turn this yellow uh, compound to purple formazan. So you'll see a color change, which you can easily read in a plate reader. So when we did that and we looked at cell survival, and now you have to go longer because cells, remember I, I told you they can survive ER stress for in short uh, intervals, but uh, you have to give it a prolonged time of ER stress to see uh, cell death. So when we looked at the control HeLa cells, uh, within 36 hours of tunica mycin treatment, they were still pretty uh, viable, about 80 to 85% or so. 
Whereas in case of our uh, give depleted cells, the cell viability was reduced to about um, 55 to 60%. They were still alive, they are quite sturdy. Um, they're not that easy to kill, but uh, this was a significant decrease. So that gave us the confidence to move forward with the study. Uh, there was uh, something to it. So the next question uh, we wanted to ask was, okay, we had that genetically engineered cell line and we showed that if you take give out, cells don't survive that much. But was it all due to give? Was there any other artifact we introduced while um, genetically engineering that cell line? So in order to address that question, then what you do is you re-express give in the give depleted cells. Now, there, this is a construct you will express from the outside. This is not cells own give. You are you have it cloned on a plasmid and you let your cells express it. Um, now, the key here is that this cDNA of give will be um, mRNA, uh, the shRNA resistant. So only the endogenous give will be will not be made, but the overexpressed or the exogenously expressed give will be made. So let's see if uh, we were able to do that. So this is just a blot confirming that here is your control cells, here are give depleted cells, uh, just expressing a plasmid or expressing um, give um, exogenously, which was expressed right here. You can also look at the phosphate KT levels. So remember from zero to three in control cells, if you treat with tunicamycin, the phosphate KT levels go up doesn't happen in the uh, give depleted cells, but now these give depleted cells, if they are expressing give on top of it, you actually see a lot of phospho AKT even at time zero. And uh, at time three, you don't see that much of an increase because it's already reaching uh, what's called the ceiling effect. So if you looked at the cell survival using the same MTT assay I just showed you, so here are control cells, here are your give depleted cells, the cell survival is down. Uh, see what happens when you express give back uh, from um, an outside source. The cell survival is actually even better than control cells. So that tells you that give is um, uh, giving this capability to, uh, or is important um, in allowing cancer cells to live through stress. And if it was all because of give and AKT connection, then can I simply rescue the cell survival by activating AKT by bypassing give? And for this, we used a small molecule activator of AKT, SC79. So it just allosterically binds to the kinase and activates it uh, without it needing any of the upstream uh, events. So we can bypass give. So these cells, even though they don't express give, but they were treated with SC79, they have a good um, level of phospho AKT. These are all tunicamycin treated. And this is what happens uh, to cell survival. It is um, almost restored back, not 100%, but um, it is quite comparable to the control cells. So this work, and as I said, we did a lot more work uh, in this paper, but in the interest of time, I did not show it. Uh, but if you're interested, please um, read um, this paper of ours, which was published in 2018 and went online in 2019, it came in print. Um, so these are the students who did all the work. Uh, I was just in the supervisory uh, uh, role here. Uh, so three of them are now PhD candidates. Um, they are both in their third year. Um, Kelly just joined my alma mater, Loyola University, Chicago. And Joanna was an undergrad, so she uh, was in her third year of undergrad. Uh, she completed her bachelor's in biochemistry, and now she's getting her second bachelor's in electrical and electronics engineering. Um, how are we doing on time, sir? No, no, we have we have sufficient time. You please continue. Okay, All right. I, I have a few more slides, so. Please let me know if I'm going over time so I can just try to wrap it up then. No, no, sure, sure. You please complete. I'm sorry? No, you can take your time. Okay, thank you. All right, so after that uh, work was published, uh, we had already started looking into another aspect of cancer cells and ER stress. Um, so there's a 
big amount of literature out there which says GRP78. It is one of the ER resident chaperones. It helps proteins fold properly. But there is a lot of data out there suggesting that um, many different types of cancers had GRP78 overexpressed. And not just overexpressed within the cell, but at the cell surface. And that meant poor prognosis for the patient. So the higher the GRP78 in that cancer, uh, the lower the survival um, chances of the patient and the more chemo resistant the cancer was. So we wanted to see if GIV had any connection with GRP78. Um, so for ER stress, the balances either survive or die and the yin and yang, um, so GRP78, higher GRP78 means more protection, more survival for the cells, whereas if you have pro-apoptotic factors, um, that means more uh, cell death. So what we did was, so I'm again going to summarize some of the data here. Um, we wanted to see if GIV and GRP78 interact, and that's a very typical biochemical um, study. If you want to see two proteins working in the same pathway, uh, the, one of the very first things you do is, is to see if they bind to each other. So we first confirmed it by mass spectrometry. We did a um, GST pull down, that's a binding assay, and we had uh, it proteo proteomically um, checked that yeah, the two proteins were coming down together. And I also confirmed it biochemically by doing these pull-down assays and using the uh, Western blot uh, with specific antibodies. So, and we also saw that ER stress, when once I ER stress the cells, this interaction goes uh, higher significantly. So they interact better when there's ER stress uh, in the cell. But that could have been an artifact, you know. One protein I told you, GRP78, is an ER resident protein. It should be present within the ER under normal uh, conditions. And then we have GIV, on the other hand, which is present on the other side of the ER. It's a uh, membrane, uh, can associate with the membranes peripherally, but on the other side of the ER, or it can be cytosolic. So there was that conundrum. How do they even? meet each other? How do they see each other? And all of these uh, experiments listed here, they were done after I lice opened the cells. So is, is, was that just an artifact of lysing them open? And these two proteins now have a chance to interact, whereas in an intact cell, they won't. So we had to confirm it in some other way. This was all very good. You know, We did a domain mapping. Uh, we got a lot of data out of uh, these techniques. But what we needed to do was look at in situ interaction between GRP78 and GIV. And uh, in situ here means that you are looking at intact cells. The cells are not broken open, they're just fixed. So everything is where it should be. All the organelles are intact. And then um, I performed a proximity ligation assay. So a proximity ligation assay is a very neat technique you can look at endogenous uh, protein interactions and it is um, uh, oligo-based. So the two proteins that you are trying to see if they interact or not, you have two different antibodies, specific antibodies, and then the secondaries that recognize those primary antibodies are conjugated with uh, specific oligos. And if those oligos are close enough together, and that will only happen if the two proteins are within um, each other's proximity, and within binding distance, they come together and you add a mix that's commercially uh, available and it will promote rolling circle replication. And finally, you can uh, look at your cells under the microscope and only if the um, DNA has replicated well enough that the probe will be able to bind to it and give you a red dot. Each red dot here signifies one molecular interaction. So that confirmed um, our previous biochemical and proteomic data that when we treat cells with tunica mycin, GIV and GRP78 do interact in an intact cell uh, at endogenous level. And when we quantify it was highly significant uh, compared to DMSO treated, the vehicle control versus the tunica mycin treated cells. 
And then we also looked at the cells under the microscope. And uh, so red here is GRP78, give is shown in the green fluorophore, and here's the merged image. So it's the same cell. Um, I have an antibody and the secondary, which is tagged with the red fluorophore, green fluorophore, and yellow if they are merged um, well together. So I hope you can appreciate that. You can see at the edge of the cells, we saw uh, quite a bit of yellow pixels and we also quantified them by the way. So this is very qualitative, um, but it looked like these two were co-localizing together and most likely at the cell surface. As I mentioned just a few slides ago, that there's a lot of uh, data out there already suggesting that cell surface GRP78, so somehow, in these cancer cells, GRP78 leaves the ER, reaches the cell surface, and if it does so, and if you find it on the cell surface, it's bad news for the patient. Um, so we wanted to see if GIV was involved in this translocation of GRP78 at all. So what we did uh, was another assay called cell surface biotinylation. So what you do is all the, the, the cells are intact. What you're doing is biotinylating all the cell surface proteins. Now, biotin and avidin uh, are uh, very tight affinity partners. So once these uh, all the cell surface proteins are biotinylated, you break open the cells and you pass it through an avidin or strapped avidin affinity column. Only the biotinylated proteins will stick to the column. Everything else will go through. So we'll call that the flow through, which didn't bind, and whatever bound was our cell surface fraction. So. There's a bunch of controls here that we had to look at, but if you just pay your attention here, that's the GRP78, that cell surface. So control and tunicamycin, or DMSO and tunicamycin in control cell, you can see the GRP78 um, is increased at the cell surface. Whereas if you have give depleted cells, um, that did not change at all. So that, um, told us that GIVE is helping GRP78 reach the cell surface, which is making the cancer cells more sturdy. And here's the quantification of that data, can significantly reduce cell surface localization in GIVE depleted cells. So finally, so all of this was done in cells, in petri dishes, um, um, you know, how much ever we came close to um, being physiologically relevant, it was after all chemically induced stress, uh, cells grown in a petri dish with a good amount of food. So we weren't really mimicking um, the exact um, tumor conditions. So at that point, I collaborated uh, with Dr. Sahu and Koch at UC San Diego. Uh, so what they did for us was this uh, disease-free survival of breast cancer patients. We also did this with colorectal cancer patients and um, uh, liver cancer uh, patients, but I'm just showing you uh, the data for breast cancer patients here. Uh, so what you are looking at is a disease-free survival. Of, it's a big data set of uh, over 200 or so patients in each set. Uh, ESR low uh, means estrogen receptor low. So these were breast cancer patients where the expression of ESR1 was low and breast cancer patients with ESR high. Um, so they selected from all of these patients the patients that were the whose cancers were expressing high amount of GRP78. Among those patients, then they split them into give high, high give, or give low. And then they plotted the disease-free survival of these patients. So what you're looking at uh, on the x-axis is the months before the cancer came back. So all of these patients were diagnosed with the cancer, they were treated for it, uh, they were declared cancer free, and then they were tracked uh, on when their cancer came back or didn't. Uh, so I think you can appreciate that the green line is high GRP78, but low give expression. So these patients had a much higher, much more significantly higher um, disease-free survival rate than if the patients had both high GRP78 and high GIVE right here. And it was the trend for both ESR low and ESR high um, cancer patients. So again, the red is the GIVE high and GRP78 high. You can see significantly decreased uh, disease-free survival in these patients. 
Um, again, this is correlative. We're just looking at the expression levels of the two proteins and just um, bringing them together and seeing the correlation. But it kind of validates our entire biochemical um, and molecular findings that there is something to it and these two proteins are important uh, in providing cancer cells with a selective advantage uh, to become uh, sturdy, survive uh, more during stress, and eventually become chemoresistant. So this work was published in Feb's Letters um, last year, I believe. Um, and again, I skipped um, quite a few of the data uh, to stay on time. So please feel free to take a look at this paper if you're interested. And here's the team that worked on uh, this paper. And again, um, these four are now PhD candidates uh, at very prestigious universities. And Ida just joined my lab as a master's student. She was an undergrad in the lab and now she's staying on uh, for two more years to complete her master's. So our working model uh, is that during ER stress, uh, how cancer cells survive is through um, a combined action of GIF, GRP78, and AKT. Um, we are currently focused, uh, heavily focused on AKT and figuring out its role in the unfolded protein response, um, which I, the, the, the whole signaling, I didn't have time to show you. So we are he very heavily invested in that. But um, since it's unpublished data, I didn't um, put it in my presentation here. But that's where we are headed. Um, so what's next? I told you what we are doing uh, currently, but um, I'll just leave you with this teaser. So one of the projects in undergrad is leading in the lab is looking at aspirin and its effect on the cell's ability to mount um, uh, a response to ER stress. Um, so aspirin, um, uh, you know, as you may be aware, is low dose aspirin is prescribed to um, out of the cardiovascular patients. Uh, and as um, Sony sir just mentioned at the beginning uh, of the lecture that uh, cardiovascular disease still remains the number one killer um, worldwide. Um, so these people are uh, prescribed aspirin and there was a, a very nice epidemiological study where they found that people who were actually taking low dose aspirin, they had a much significantly reduced um, chance of first getting colorectal cancer, and if they get it, then dying from it. So there, there is a very nice correlation there. And um, from colorectal cancer, people have moved on to studying it in uh, other types of cancer, so esophageal, stomach, breast cancer, liver cancer, and ovarian cancer. And there was uh, one or two papers which suggested there's some connection with the ER stress as well. So an undergrad in the lab is uh, leading um, this study. But I would like to make a disclaimer that this is not a medical advice and please do not take, uh, start taking aspirin, uh, one aspirin a day uh, if you don't need to. You need to consult your physician and keep in mind that most of these studies are still in their preliminary stages, okay? Uh, so with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, the funding agencies that have kept my lab going because this research is not cheap. It takes a lot of uh, money. Uh, so I'm really thankful to all the funders and especially NIH. Um, that's my primary source of funding these days. And I'm awaiting the results of uh, a new grant I've submitted and fingers crossed. And of course, my students, the team um, of students I've had uh, over these last six years. Uh, they did all the hard work. Uh, I was just there uh, to cheer them. I was their cheerleader and just in supervisory uh, capacity. And Prinzer mentioned earlier um, that I you know, probably don't know how good it feels or what teachers feel. I do now, sir. I, I am in your shoes and I see the joy I feel uh, when they do so well, when they go to these big universities uh, in uh, PhD programs. One of my recent uh, undergrads, he's actually now a grad student in Dr. Randy Sheckman's lab, and he was a Nobel laureate in 2013. And someone whose work I've admired and I've followed uh, all through these years. 
So um, I can totally relate to how uh, you must feel when you see your students um, uh, move on and um, make you proud. So I, I, I sincerely hope I've, I've made you proud and, and uh, it's, it's, um, it's an honor. And with that, I, I couldn't um, end my talk without thanking all of you, um, the faculty of the Department of Microbiology at Punjab University. You guys have been instrumental in shaping my scientific career. Um, and I remember each and every one of you so fondly um, and talked to my students about you and my experiences when I was an undergrad, when I was a master's student. Um, I could not find pictures of um, Saroj ma'am, Tiwari sir, uh, Gupta sir, Didit sir, Gwinder sir, so I just listed their names. Um, but please do know that you have been really important figures in my life uh, and I owe a lot uh, to you guys. And belated happy Teacher's Day, you know, it was um, two weeks or so ago. Uh, so thank you from the bottom of my heart. And finally, uh, Prince sir, um, especially to you, uh, I am indebted to you. And as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, um, you laid such a solid foundation that um, I haven't looked back uh, since then. So it's been some 20 odd years. Um, as you said, uh, you know, you're, you're like family. Uh, you, Nina, Mem, Sahir, and this picture, you know, this is back when there were no digital cameras. So we couldn't check that Nina, Mem had closed her eyes. It's only after you print the picture, you see what you uh, actually look like. So you can't delete it. Uh, but this is the only one I had of all four of us together. So I put it up here. So thank you. Thank you. Truly. Thank you. And thank you, uh, thank you to the audience. Uh, thank you for joining on a lovely Friday morning. Um, it's um, almost 10.45 PM for me. Uh, but I'm all charged up and ready to take any questions that you might have. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Bali. That was a highly informative, nice, and inspiring presentation. The thank lecture you. highlighted various factors causing stress to the human body, especially the endoplasmic reticulum, the continuous membrane system in eukaryotic cells, and its effect on the physiology of the cells, leading to the development of some diseases, including cancer type 2 diabetes, etc. Cells make the decision on life or death on the basis of degree of ER stress. However, cancer cells survive and thrive under stress. The speaker discussed various molecular strategies in the cancer cells for surviving and thriving under stress. The lecture has been well responded on the Facebook and I'm sure this might have added to the awareness of the audience. Okay. We have several queries from our participants. So I will ask that Prince Sharma take a few of these and coordinate the discussion session with the speaker and summarize the lecture with his concluding remarks. So that Prince Sharma, please do the honors. Okay. It's not. It's my honor actually uh, that uh, I am uh, entrusted with this job of summarizing uh, the Pali's uh, uh, lecture. Although it's not my domain actually, but uh, I sat through the whole thing, and Nina is sitting with me, and we have been discussing, and we have been uh, writing questions also for you, the Pali. So, <laughs> and uh, it's uh, such a good uh, and a wonderful uh, work you have been doing on uh, stress and uh, for general public uh, also not only for the academicians but it's good for general public also that uh, uh, how does uh, stress uh, uh, it mediates uh, to or leads to the cancer development uh, it's a, a it's a really pioneering work where you have uh, uh, tried to <clears throat> unfold the roles of uh, uh, ekt or uh, give uh, or uh, GRP78 proteins and correlations with the development of the cancer is uh, really a wonderful uh, new uh, insights into the cancer work. I have uh, <clears throat> a couple of uh, questions for you uh, which have been uh, put by some people and uh, probably Nina is also asking a question that uh, you have shown this uh, relation with or interaction with GIVE and GRP78 uh, if we want to target uh, any one of them as a <clears throat> uh, as a <clears throat> drug target, any one of these will there be? You choose that any one of these two will be a better drug target uh, 
and if that is going to be a better drug target it is going to have some side effects or some effect on other uh, physiology or metabolism of uh, the it's cancer not. cells or not no. just of the normal cells I'm sure. Yeah. Um, excellent question, Prince. So the whole um, the GRP field and the investigators who are studying um, cell surface GRP78 are very excited mm -hmm. because only in cancer cells you find it on the cell surface. Normal cells will keep it within the endoplasmic reticulum, so it's pretty well hidden within the cell. So it makes an excellent target, uh, and you can envision that you know it won't affect the normal cells because they won't have. GRP78 expression on the cell surface. So if you had a specific antibody, and in fact, there are a few which other groups are pursuing. So if you can target, um, find something that's very specific to GRP78 and doesn't cross the cell, um, there you go. You have a um, uh, target, a uh, very specific target for cancer cells. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. might add here, it's also another group uh, nearby in another university. So what they did was, um, so GRP78 is essential for survival. So if you take both copies of the gene out, uh, it's embryonic lethal. But if you take one copy out, uh, the mice didn't show any difference. They were as you know physiologically and everything they could test for, they looked as good as normal uh, mice, but they had a much um, a significantly reduced chance of growing tumors. So that, that also validates that, you know, you can keep some amount of GRP78 that's essential, but only one copy is, is good enough for survival and will prevent um, these uh, cancer-related issues. Yeah, yeah, I, know. I think uh, you're right that way. Um, I have another uh, query coming up, actually, in my mind, is that uh, you talked about... Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Kalia is keen to ask something. I know. <laughs> I uh, just uh, just after this question, sir. Uh, you talked about aspirin also. That aspirin um, is a preliminary study, but might play a wonderful role in uh, uh, the cancer patients actually. But on the other hand, the governments are banning um, uh, this aspirin also. So can there be a balance between the take uh, this use of uh, aspirin or only for the cancer patients? Yeah, so it's you know hard to say unless we do a controlled study, but the colorectal cancer and aspirin uh, correlation is true. And if you think about it, and it's only low dose aspirin, we're not talking about aspirin that we would take, you know, disprint for a headache. This is a much lower dose that the heart patients take on a daily basis to keep their blood uh, thinner, so to prevent blood clots. Uh, but what it ended up happening uh, or doing was uh, because colorectal cancer inflammation is one of the main culprits and aspirin is also anti-inflammatory. So if you take low dose aspirin over years, I think it keeps inflammation under check and that you know, kind of makes sense that it will um, prevent the chance of colorectal cancer happening or the severity of it. Um, so yeah, but, but there's, you know, wonderful avenues to pursue and if, something yeah. as innocuous as aspirin, which people have taken for years. And if we can see there, there are these uh, wonderful side effects, if you want to call them, you know, these are the wanted side effects. So. Right. Okay. Uh, Dr. Kalia has uh, probably some words of wisdom or some questions. Dr. Kalia, please unmute yourself. I'm ready for oh. <laughs> No, actually, I was waiting that uh, because if I also uh, switch on my speaker, then disturbance. Okay. So actually, uh, I could not keep much pace with the bugs which you have explained. To be frank, I tried a little bit, but very soon I lost the track because I have no clue about uh, the cancers as such. And, uh, but uh, as a microbiologist, I am very curious for the last six years how microbes can actually act as anti-cancer agents. And uh, I have gathered quite a bit of information and I have compiled also. And uh, I am trying that how actually quorum sensing can play a vital role in uh, bacterial quorum sensing and as an anti-cancer agent. I am not succeeding very well, but what, what do you think about, is there any potential or is it just con too conceptual 
for people no i think it's a wonderful <laughs> idea and if you think about it the gut is the largest organ we have and that's where we are putting things from outside and people are eating uh, and overeating uh, these days in the last 20 years or so you know the the gut microbiome is changing and we are also seeing the increased incidence of cancer worldwide so i would go for it i'm actually um, quite impressed with this thought and this idea uh, and i think uh, even though preliminary and you may not have much data there is definitely um, potential in it uh, I have I have been studying this for six years now, right? <laughs> but uh, still struggling to publish my work. Maybe soon we will get a luck, publication. Sir. I look forward to reading it. When once it's out, please do let me know. So you you have given me hope that <laughs> yes, I will survive. <laughs> you will try, you know. uh, I said that microbiome uh, is uh, now uh, a talk of uh, all the academicians actually it's playing a great role as microbiologist Dr. Kalia knows it very well that gut microbiome how important it is and how our heating habits they are changing your gut microbiome uh, every day probably and it, that's why people say you eat right the right kind of thing actually and uh, now there is a talk of about so many probiotics also which show anti-cancerous properties right. there are so many bifidobacteria or the other uh, uh, microbes present in the gut which uh, play a role in uh, uh, in your gut and play a role as anti-cancer compounds actually even uh, pseudomonas we had seen we had been doing a study on pseudomonas aeruginosa is a pathogen but it produces certain compounds like pyocyanin which show anti-cancerous properties so i feel that uh, nature has given us a gut microbiome which is uh, for your benefit but if you are bent upon uh, ruining yourself by having the bad habits who can protect you i think that <laughs> your bi microbes are mostly for your benefit <laughs> Kusum, ma'am. Doctor uh, Kusum, unmute yourself, Doctor Kusum. I was also extending this question only that what recommendation can the Pali give to the audience to avoid the ER stress? Because <laughs> see, or to prevent ER stress, can we do something uh, at our own level relating to maybe diet, maybe living style, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera? To avoid because see the culprit is that only he yeah. wants it to overworks insulin is fitted yeah. out yeah. triggers the upr and things like that so right. can we nip the evil in the bud well um, another excellent question so when we talk about diabetes definitely um it that's the problem you know how if it's uncontrolled and goes on for years and years ultimately the person will switch from pre-diabetic to type 2 diabetic and ER stress is what kills the beta cells eventually. So if we can keep that under control, um, you know, we, we can be in a much better place. And number of um, people with the type two diabetes and obesity, and that, that's becoming an epidemic in itself, mm -hmm. or we should start calling it a pandemic too, because it's a worldwide phenomenon now. Uh, people have abundance of food, high energy, rich food, um, and are, um, work habits are becoming more and more sedentary you know we're not moving about as much uh, we glue to our screens you know now more than ever uh, and uh, there's a lot of um, work also done on type 2 diabetes and how these people um, are more susceptible to many different types of cancers so uh, if you think about it insulin you know its main job is to um, maintain or regulate our glucose levels the homeostasis but insulin um, is also a growth factor. It, it binds to a growth factor receptor. It can trigger the growth uh, signaling, much like I showed you in EGFR. So if you have too much insulin present in your bloodstream because you're trying to regulate the blood glucose level, you're also fueling the growth uh, signaling. And that's what cancer cells need. So again, there's a strong biochemical um, uh, correlation between type 2 diabetes and uh, cancer um, generation. So and yes. are there are there any other insults or are there any other uh, stresses which ER comes across in our body? Oh, uh, so many. So in fact, ER is such a hub of you know, or an important organelle. So it's not just ER stress itself that something is misfolding within the ER. You can also trigger it with oxidative stress. 
uh, many different kinds of insults to the cell ultimately will also trigger your ER stress response. Mm. Certain um, environmental insults in our body itself. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And the main goal. I think, uh, even uh, the SARS uh, infection. Yes. Mm. That's uh, right. COVID is mm. causing some. Uh, there were uh, studies on that. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. Dipali can tell that. Yeah, and also, you know, there was only one study, and I don't know if somebody followed up on it, but it's been, you know, so rapidly evolving. Uh, there was one study which said uh, SARS-CoV-2 can bind to GRP78 on the cell surface and internalize that way. So, but I don't know if anybody's followed up on that. There was only one uh, that I uh, looked up. But it's uh, any any type of cellular stress, the cell's first response is to survive. You know, that that's the... Holy Grail. So they want to survive, but if it gets out of control, there's that threshold. And I couldn't tell you because all my work is in a laboratory in petri dishes. So what constitutes that threshold in an actual person? You know, when do the cells within the body say too much, can't can't deal with it anymore? So um, all of this, and again, you know, diet plays a big role. So if we are eating and living healthy. We can avoid all sorts of cellular stresses as well as um, uh, you know mental stresses too. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Adipali. Now I will say, uh, Dr. Kalia, if he can have some last words of wisdom to us. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I, I am just trying to understand many things you know, simultaneously, but uh, very curious to learn. But my focus right now is quorum sensing. So, so I keep uh, deep into it. <laughs> and uh, biomolecules, I think personally, are what are going to take the lead in the future. So everything, we, with whatever disease we have, it will be bioactive molecules alone which will do the job. So that is the future, in my opinion. So I don't know <laughs> how far my predictions or thinking will hold good, but uh, my experience shows that these are the potentials where we should focus. Actually, many people in India are not even talking of biomolecules actively. Yeah. But they are the most thing, important things which many, many people can study easily. Yeah. But uh, uh, they don't realize that it's very important. Mm -hmm. Well, good luck with your uh, research. So don't give up. Thank you. Yeah. That's how most of the time works. <laughs> okay, I know I will keep you informed about my activities. Sounds good. I look forward to it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Sony, over to you, sir. So thank you, Dr. Prince. Now, I also request that we see earlier to give his views and blessings over on our weekend lecture series started by EMI Chandigarh Unit. <laughs> no, no, sir. I am the most strong supporter of these uh, activities because uh, we really have now uh, an opportunity. In fact, we, previously we used to think we have to invite somebody, but now you can sit anywhere and still deliver a lecture. So I yeah. think the best thing this AMI unit of Chandigarh is doing, and they have taken the initiative, and Dr. Naveen Gupta is a very strong leader. So very yeah. good. And Dr. A. Uh, Prince Sharma, as Dr. Sony said, AMI Chandigarh president, I think he will be the president of AMI very soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. Best of luck. Thank, thank, thank you, Dr. So, thank you, Dr. Kalia. So, we now come to the last session of today's program, that is a vote of thanks. I now request that Naveen Gupta, the General Secretary of AMI Chandigarh Unit, to do the honors by delivering the vote of thanks. That is Naveen, please. Before Naveen starts, I, uh, Dipali and everyone, I say that uh, we have been running lots of programs. Uh, this AMI has been doing lots of programs in the Sunday uh, series. Naveen is the force behind that. He is the main person who has been uh, instrumental in uh, the successful uh, uh, lecture series, Sunday lecture series. Dr. Naveen. And over to Dr. Naveen. Please deliver the vote of thanks. Uh, Naveen, you are not audible. Yeah. 
Can't not hear audible. You. Can't hear you. you are not audible. That mean no, you are not audible. <laughs> no. He's unmuted, although I don't know. Yeah, he's in some problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you able to hear us? He's coming. Yeah, yeah. You are not audible. <laughs> So that Naveen has some problem uh, in the network. So that's why he is not able to. Uh, so on his behalf, uh, I would like to deliver the word of thanks. So uh, I'm thankful to that uh, uh, Dipali Bandari for sparing her valuable time and making us aware about the recent developments of how the cancer cells they survive and thrive under stress. So I also express my gratitude to Professor Prin Sharma, President AMI Chandigarh, and also Dean Faculty of Science, Punjab University, for providing encouragement, guidance, and support in organizing this event. I also extend a special thanks to Professor V. C. Tralia for sparing his valuable time and gracing the occasion with his presence, with his presence, and also motivating us for our weekend lecture series. So I also like to attend a special thanks to Professor Kusamajai, Chairperson Department of Microbiology, for her active participation, for smooth running of this event and all other activities that we carry on weekends. So I also mention a deep sense of appreciation for Dr. Naveen Gupta, who is also the General Secretary AMI Chandida Union, for taking the initiative of this program and making it a bit success. So I also acknowledge my faculty colleagues from the Department of Microbiology, Punjab University, for their support, their valuable suggestions, and their help in organizing all events, including, including today's event. I would also like to extend a special thanks to Dr. Dinti Rahi for gracing this Ukrainian and for introducing the speaker to the audience. So special thanks are also due for all the participants for their active support in this event. So at the end, I extend special appreciation to the crew team of AMA Chandida unit who worked in coordination and synergistically with Dr. Naveen Gupta to make this event a great success. So with this, we come to the end of today's program and uh, it is time to disperse and to say goodbye. So with these words, Goodbye to all. See you Goodbye soon, all of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and Dr. Dipali, you must think you are still young because we ourselves consider ourselves as young. So yeah. you cannot, <laughs> <laughs> you cannot Otherwise bypass we have that. To grow. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> Otherwise, we have to grow. We have to grow. Yes. <laughs> so keep thinking that you are young and keep doing good work. <laughs> yeah, please continue to be young. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All the best. Bye. Bye, Dipali. Bye. 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 Okay. Bye. Bye.